recording now. Okay. okay. The speaker today, um, Professor Greta Panova, she is from South California, but she's Bulgarian. She's a winner of a couple of international and Balkan Olympiads. And also she is a, um, 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 she is the third person who has the, the, the mathematical prize of our institute, which is given for Bulgarians, independently where they work in Bulgaria or abroad. And the rules are the same as for the field medals. They should be below 40 when um, to get the prize. And also, um, um, uh, she got the prize a year ago, but it will be given the next uh, Wednesday in the, in the National Colloquium in Mathematics of Bulgaria, but it, it should be personal. So if you want to be there, you should, you should go to Bulgaria. And at the institute, this is um, the next Wednesday, and the next Wednesday, uh, Wednesday 4.15, I think, okay. p.m. Bulgarian time. Okay, Greta, please. All right, thank you so much for this uh, uh, warm introduction. And uh, yes, it's, it's an honor and to finally actually give a talk in Bulgaria. It's going to be in English now, but on, on Wednesday, it's going to be in person and it's going to be in Bulgarian. On a, on a related topic to this one, slightly different. So, um, so today, uh, I'm going to talk about these chronic ear coefficients. So these are, uh, let me just tell you briefly what, what I do and what the, the universe I live in is uh, concerns. So I, my field is algebraic combinatoric. So as, as academician Drensky said, I'm a student of Richard Stanley, who is basically the, the father of this, of this field. Um, and uh, algebraic combinatorics studies using discrete methods or combinatorial methods, objects that come from algebra, algebraic geometry, and so on. And, uh, and thanks to all this interconnectivity, there are many, um, many relations to other fields. So, so here, so for example, there is connection with statistical mechanics, especially integrable probability, where you study big objects like this, they can be studied with algebraic methods. So there is a connection to algebraic geometry um, and enumerative algebraic geometry as well. And, uh, and for the talk today, the main connection is going to be with representation theory, which hopefully you, the audience in this, in this seminar would know about. And, uh, and there is going to be a little bit of connection with complexity theory, although the, this, this type of questions we will discuss on Wednesday and that talk will be in person. So yeah, so, so only for the people who are in Bulgaria. Um, okay, so, so what, what's, what's at the base of everything we do? Um, so the combinatorial objects, very simple. So permutations, which you can think of as bijections between the set of one n to one n, maps, and so on. So if you think of them as functions, then they form a group. And then there are integer partitions. So with the, you take an integer, in this case, it's going to be five. And uh, you break it into some so that the parts are weakly decreasing and you can actually draw them as a stack of boxes. This is what's called the Young diagram. So here we have three boxes corresponding to this part and here we have two boxes corresponding to this part. And, um, and these objects are immediately related to algebra. So, so the permutations, they form the symmetric group as n on n letters. And uh, if you move, take one step further, you start um, looking, studying representation theory of this symmetric group. Uh, so representing these permutations as matrices, and then we can classify the reducible uh, uh, modules. And these are called the Specht modules. They are um, the complete set of irreducible modules 
is in one-to-one -one, is in one-to-one -one correspondence with partitions lambda of n, and uh, so they are indexed by lambda. What they really look like, it's very hard to describe, but somehow they're, the basis for such a module is indexed by standard Young tableau. So this would be uh, assignments of the numbers from one up to n bijective assignments to these boxes so that they are strictly increasing along rows and down columns. And uh, if you want to know more about what algebraic combinatorics does, well, these are very central objects, so you can actually do a lot by studying them, understanding how these configurations work and so on. So very, very few restrictions, but still uh, quite interesting uh, mathematics there. And, uh, and the counterpart, and I really say counterpart because there is the sure vial duality because between symmetric group and the general linear group. So general linear group is invertible matrices. So for the purposes of this talk, the underlying field of constants is going to be always the complex number. So I am not going to get involved into any number theoretic issues. I know some of you were hoping to see something like that, but this is not, not what we'll do right now. And, uh, and of course, and the irreducible, so there are infinitely many irreducible mod GLN modules because this is also an infinite reductive group, but uh, they, the, because it's a reductive group, this uh, unique factorizations into irreducible still applies and, um, in, and, uh, and the irreducible modules here are the vial modules. They are also indexed by partitions, except this time these partitions have at most big n parts. And the combinatorics is hidden into these generalizations called semi-standard young tableau when we are allowing repetitions of uh, the letters inside the box. Okay, so, so let's, uh, let's get to the Kronecker coefficients. So, uh, so let's look at the, hard, at the details of this uh, re uh, representation theory that I just mentioned. So, uh, so there are quantities that we like to study in these fields, and uh, usually it's dimension. So with each of these modules, we can talk about dimension. Dimension is actually, there are very nice formulas for that. This is... Uh, the hook length formula for standard Young, which counts the number of standard Young tableau or uh, the vial determinantal formula and so on. So this is not, this is already understood. Uh, the next step of uh, what people would study here in representation theory is when you take tensor product of re representations, how does it factor into irreducibles? And if we look at the general linear group and the vial modules, we can take the tensor product and uh, decompose it into irreducibles. Each irreducible will show up with some certain multiplicity. Uh, so here are the indices, lambda, mu, and nu. So the multiplicity will depend on the three parameters, three partitions. And in, for the general linear group, these are called the littlewood richardson coefficients. Uh, and Littlewood-Richardson coefficients, naturally, by definition, they're going to be non-negative integers, being multiplicities. And uh, it was a claim of Littlewood and Richardson from 1934, but it took quite a while to actually prove rigorously that this number is equal to the number of certain type of tableau, of shape, skew shape, mu over mu, and type lambda. And uh, here is an example of how this works and we really don't need to know the details the point is that we we can associate discrete objects with this number so the number of certain configurations easily described configurations is equal to this number c nu lambda and mu for example if we want to compute this little wood richardson coefficients we will take what's called a skew shape. So this is like a Young diagram, which is nested between two other Young diagrams. And, uh, and we fill it with the numbers. So type 432 means that we have four ones, 
three twos and two threes. And there is one more condition that uh, basically when you when you read this sequence, it's going to be a ballot sequence. So it's it's another sort of linear inequality type condition. So this is these uh, objects are easy to check. And so if you know uh, complexity theory, which I I guess maybe many of you in this seminar know, uh, this basically this formula is telling us that we can uh, this uh, this problem of computing this little wood richardson coefficient given this input lambda mu and nu this is a sharp p problem um, and uh, it's actually a theorem of knudsen and tau that to this deciding whether this number is zero in or not is polynomial and this is an amazing fact actually because it's usually not like that <laughs> Uh, okay, so let's take another step further or step back, depending on where you started, and start look at the symmetric group. So symmetric group should be simpler, right? So it's like finite group. We can take two ir uh, irreducible modules, spec modules. We can decompose them into irreducibles with some multiplicities. What are these multiplicities? These are this Kronecker coefficient. So they depend on three partitions here, lambda, mu, and nu. This is the multiplicity of this module in this tensor product. Here are some examples. This is how it decomposes. For example, here the Kronecker coefficients are all one that are of interest. And uh, using character theory, so this is finite group, we can express the Kronecker coefficient as a sum over all permutations of Sn, the product of these three characters. So, um, so uh, the character of this representation, this is the diagonal action, so it's just the product of the two characters, characters being traces, so tensor product of matrices, we can just multiply the two traces. Um, and uh, and we know, so if you notice something here, there are normally when you take inner products of characters, you would actually take a complex conjugate, but uh, we actually know that the characters of the symmetric group are integers, so real, real integers, so we don't need to do that, and this shows that this character is symmetric in lambda mu and nu. So let's just look at this formula for a moment. Um, can you tell me from this formula whether the whether the Kronecker coefficient is a non-negative integer? Any guesses? <laughs> I mean, okay, so so of course by definition it's a non-negative integer. <laughs> But uh, from this formula, we don't know because characters can be positive and negative, and here we have a huge sum. So, so this formula only gives us symmetry and not that much else. And uh, and really, this is actually one of the main problems. So, as somebody mentioned, Jeff Remmel, who was who was working on the Kronecker coefficients 30 years ago. So Murnagam defined them in 1938, so 80-something years ago. And then Stanley took, took, took over and listed this as one of the main open problems, is try to find some kind of formula for these numbers, which actually demonstrates that they are non-negative integers, like this character formula I just showed you. So, can we do something like there is for the little Wood Richardson coefficient? So say that g lambda mu nu is equal to the number of certain discrete objects that we can enumerate. And uh, or in other words, can we say that computing the Kronecker coefficient is in sharp p? Uh, so why why do we uh, care about such a problem? Well, so the classical motivation here is what I just showed you, little Wood Richardson coefficients, and in fact, little Wood Richardson coefficients show up 
as a special case of the chronic ear coefficient. So they actually generalize the little Wood Richardson explicitly for every triple of partitions with this condition here. There, of course, there is going to be a little Wood Richardson coefficient, and that little Wood Richardson coefficient is equal to this particular chronic ear coefficient. So here we take these three partitions and we add a large first part. So this is this is very nice, but this is very special case. And uh, another reason why we would like to understand them is that recently um, these chronic ear coefficients they showed up in various forms in computational complexity theory. Um, first of all, there are like we can actually formulate this question. Aha, uh -huh, that's a very good question. I will answer in a moment. So, so okay. So, so Jose Brox is asking, how do we define combinatorial objects? And it's very right to say that this is not well defined notion. But what is well defined is the other formulation. So, uh, so this is this is informal informal notion number of objects but if you show that computing the chronic ear coefficient is in sharp p basically what is sharp p sharp p is the class of problems where where we enumerative class of problems where you can count exponentially many discrete objects each of which which of these objects being polynomially described in polynomially computable so so this this would be the formal way of defining combinatorial objects would be the that type of a proof in here but you're right so it's not uh, it's a uh, it's a good question because uh, when they ask uh, this type of questions they have something in mind of what it should look like but it's not actually formally stated and of course this is a problem in uh, for mathematicians and in particular if you can if if it's stated like this we cannot disprove it right but we can actually disprove it that it's in sharpie when we might who knows um and uh, anyway so so then so from one hand this rep this represents a computational complexity problem on its own on the other hand it's related to what's called geometric complexity theory which is studying arithmetic complexity theory with geometric tools meaning algebraic geometric tools and um, and they also show up in invariant theory uh, moment polytopes and so on other ways of proving computational lower bounds this theory these are just some of the names who develop this theory so this is avi Vigderson who just got the abel prize um, and let's let's just say what we know since then so here jeff Remmel got one of the first results when Two of the partitions are hooked, so they look like this one large part and then one, 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 one. And then the third partition actually would be limited to being a something like a thick hook. So we'll have a two other um, like two nested hooks in each in, in themselves. So this uh, this is fully understood. There is there are there is a way of there is a combinatorial interpretation which is actually polynomial in this case but this is because of the parametrization uh, and then there are some other special cases and as you can see so it, these are actually very very special so uh, so the basically the best the most general formula that we have is this one so when one partition is a hook and the other two are arbitrary and then we actually have combinatorial interpretation so counting certain type of tableau with certain type of fillings and we can actually check whether these tableau are what they are in polynomial time so it is a sharpie formula and there are some other 
special cases, including one that I'll show in a moment. And uh, then there are the complexity results. So we can show that there are difference of two Sharpie functions. Um, and, uh, but just, just determining whether it's a zero or strictly bigger than zero, this is an NP hard problem. So from then on, we can't really hope too much that there is going to be anything very nice about this, uh, this co coefficients. And, uh, and, uh, and then again, so there is, there is very little known. So another question you can ask is, can you show some kind of lower bounds for certain types of types of classes of chronic ear coefficients? And uh, basically they, we know that they can range from zero to square root of n factorial basically. Although we, we can't really say for which partitions exactly this is going to be. Um, and that large, but we know that if if they are all very large, then there should uh, it's probably um, big. And uh, and there are some some other cases. There is the biggest maybe flagship conjecture is the conjecture of Jan Saxo from uh, Cambridge, I think who said who who said that there should exist uh, something similar to the Stein, uh, Steinberger character for uh, finite groups of Lie type basically that we can take a partition self conjugate partition there exists a, such a partition maybe it's going to be the staircase partition such that the tensor square of this partition contains every irreducible SN representation. So basically that this is positive for all mu. And uh, we have a lot of evidence that this is probably correct for this partition is something we're working on. But, um, but again, we don't really have good tools to actually tackle this. And it's a lot of ad hoc arguments. Okay, so let me tell you, um, I'm going to now show you an example of how we can use the chronic ear coefficients, despite the fact that we know very little about them, to solve other problems and uh, and and in in the course of our work, figure out something about the chronic ear coefficients that wasn't clear before. Um, so so this uh, yeah so this is going to be a combinatorial problem very simple combinatorial problem let's see how we're going to solve it so so integer partitions sequences are sequences of the weakly decreasing integers non-negative integers which sum up to n so partitions of n are these so here are all the partitions of four there are five of them so p of four is equal to five and uh, there is no formula for this closed form formula for these numbers, but there is a generating function. This is the famous generating function due to Euler. And uh, so what's the formula for this number? So <laughs> here, if you have seen the Ramanujan movie, The Man Who Knew Infinity, this is a screenshot from that movie. This is uh, uh this is percy percy mcmahon major mcmahon who who is uh, who who's who who tells ramanujan that he failed on primes to figure out the formula for the end prime and now is the and now you can not just turn around and crack partitions so number of partitions is a, is also hard and, uh, and then there is the moment of truth. So Ramanujan shows up and uh, Percy McMahon is asking him what's the number of partitions of the number of 200. So that's a huge number. And uh, here is Ramanujan's formula. 
and this is the exact formula and Ramanujan's formula is extremely close and he, this is the cardio Ramanujan asymptotic formula so there is no closed form precise formula such co concise form but um, but there is asymptotics so now so this is 100 almost 100 years ago um, so now let's simplify the problem a little bit or make it harder if you want so now so let's look at partitions which are limited in in this in this form so their young diagram belongs to an l by m rectangle so the largest part of the partition is at most m and the number of parts is at most l this is basically what this means so now there are finitely many of those and and the number of these shaded boxes this cannot go to infinity the largest it gets is um, m times l and there is a generating function for them this is actually the q analog of the binomial coefficient which you can check yourself if you set q equals to one we are just counting how many lattice paths there are from this box up to this box and this is basically m plus l choose m because we just determine at what point we are going to take a horizontal step this is the number of subsets and uh, there is a q analog so if you want to extract the p and number there is a generating function you can just take it as the coefficient of q to the n in this in this uh, q what's called q analog of this binomial coefficient uh, and then sylvester the one of the first great american mathematicians eight from eight in 1878 proved it it was conjectured by cayley the same cayley that you would so you would know uh, in 1856 that the sequence i mean it's a very simple conjecture so that these numbers are first decreasing and then decreasing so of course this is one and this is one and somehow in the middle most partitions would uh, would be somewhere close to the middle and um, that just to prove that these numbers are weakly increasing and then decreasing very very looks very simple and uh and sylvester when he solved it 20 something years later he said the following i'm about to demonstrate a theorem which has been waiting proof for the last quarter of a century and upwards i accomplished with scarcely an effort a task which i had believed lay outside the range of human power so yeah, so so Sylvester was a modest guy. How did he do this? Well, he said that he did it by aid of a constriction drawn drawn from the resources of imaginative reason. So he says he's a very uh, creative guy, and uh, well, indeed. So he used uh, Lie algebras, SL two representations, and these numbers these numbers here were interpreted as dimensions of some nest, some modules actually um, and there were maps between these modules which showed that these dimensions would increase and then later on stanley developed these ideas further so he used the hard left theorem from algebraic geometry to show this inequality and then uh, and then he simplify the, the argument using the linear algebra paradigm which just show that these are dimensions of certain vector spaces which map injectively from one to the other so of course these dimensions would be increasing and then decreasing and there is only one combinatorial proof and then and then somehow somewhat accidentally we um, we managed to involve these Kronecker coefficients in this business and figure out something about the difference between these, these numbers. 
and uh, and also and also later we actually found the exact asymptotic formulas for this like the hardy ramanujan formula but this is a topic for a different talk so so chronic your coefficients somehow show up in this in this simple combinatorial problem i want to tell you a little bit about this so just so you get a flavor of what kind of things one can do and what kind of results there are um so here is a theorem uh it's it's a it's actually a very strange result um so i'll tell you why so let's take a partition which is self-conjugate meaning that it's symmetric about the diagonal so that basically if you take the diagonal and you draw the young diagram this is going to be symmetric and uh, let's take mu hat to be the hook hook lengths of this partition at the center so basically we look at at the diagonal boxes and look at how many boxes there are here and here and count this total number so by because it's symmetric it's two mu one minus one two mu two minus three and so on and now let's take an arbitrary partition lambda of n and evaluate the irreducible character at this so this is as you know the conjugacy classes of permutations are determined by their cycle type so this is basically the value of the character at uh, at the permutation of this cycle type and uh, then we can actually say that the chronic cure coefficient lambda mu mu so this is s mu tensor squared s mu and then it's going to be direct sum and we know that this s lambda will show up with some multiplicity which is greater than or equal to the absolute value of this character evaluation and the way we prove this result was by uh, by using uh, by reduction to the alternating group and using some uh, some interesting some special properties of this of this type of reduction and values of characters um, this was an idea that was first developed by Christina Bessenroth and her student and uh, here is an example so here is this partition mu these are this this is going to be the cycle type so uh, so this is going to be 11 mu hat is going to be 11 5 3 and then um, this tableau here is just representing the Murnagam Nakayama rule for computing characters. Um, so there is basically only one way we can make what's called the Murnagam Nakayama tableau in this case. So, so for example, here, if we take the same partition lambda, then we get that the character, absolute value of the character is one, which means that the chronic cure coefficient lambda 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 is always bigger than zero if lambda is symmetric so this is this is actually a result the result of christina besson wrote earlier and um and now uh we can actually compute compute characters to some to some extent using again partition so if you if, if we take this so lambda is just a two row partition okay so that's a two row partition and evaluate the character of lambda here it's uh, using let's say jacobi trudy formula or difference of permit uh, characters of permutation modules and then we can actually say that this character is the difference between the number of partitions of n into odd distinct parts 
sorry, the number of partitions of K into odd distinct parts up to 2n minus 1 minus the number of partitions of K minus 1 into odd distinct parts. And this is basically, this definition is captured by this generating function. And, and now we have two more in, one more ingredient that the character that the chronic error coefficient if we if we uh, ah so this is a typo here so g m l m l and then lambda is equal to the difference of this these partitions. So first of all, this immediately tells us that this is greater than or equal to zero because chronic error coefficient is not negative. So, so this gives us Sylvester for free. But it also tells us that these numbers, this difference is bigger than this difference. So difference between partitions of certain kind is bigger than difference of partitions of some other kind. <laughs> Um, and this is captured by by this this generating function basically has unimodal coefficients. This is a result of Stanley. And now, what? How do we actually prove something more about this relationship? So, so let's take this a step further. So one uh, one thing we can actually estimate lower bounds for the difference of this number. So number in partitions into odd distinct parts up to 2n minus 1, the, the of consec in partitions in consecutive integers, if you take the difference is actually basically exponential at least. So this is, a, some, this is something we, one can prove using analytic tools. And then, and then basically we get from this relationship and the fact that the chronic error coefficient is going to be greater than or equal to this difference, we get that the difference of these partitions is at least exponential. So not only is Sylvester's inequality true, it's actually the difference is quite large. And, uh, and if we want to prove it for all rectangles, so this is only for squares because uh, the theorem that with the character um, bound only applied if we have a symmetric uh, self-conjugate partition. And uh, the last step is using some something very powerful about the chronic error coefficients, which does not come from sim the symmetric group. It comes from the sure vile duality and general linear group. So this property, we have no idea how to prove using the simple combinatorial definitions and using characters, for example, uh, that if we if you have two chronic error coefficients which are strictly positive for two triples of partitions, then you can add the partitions partwise, and you get an even bigger chronic error coefficient. And uh, this is proven using. GLN representations and sure while duality, but um, and and uh, but it doesn't follow from the symmetry group at all, and um, and then one one can use this fact and add up rectangles, make rectangles at uh, from squares to show that this chronic error coefficient is bigger than this other one. And then so extend these inequalities further. And so in particular, we get a lower bound, exponential lower bound for the difference, consecutive difference between partitions inside a rectangle. And uh, so here is a side, side note. So something we did later using probability actually in random variables, we, we were able to estimate using, using local central limit theorem to estimate exactly what the difference between two uh, consecutive, uh, the number of partitions which fit inside this rectangle 
between of n my n plus one and and that this difference is asymptotically exponential. So this I'm not going to tell you exactly what the formula is, but this uh, c c d and so on they they are computed from the parameters of the problem. And in particular, we get that the Kronecker coefficient rectangle rectangle and then just two row is exponential asymptotically exponential so so this is one of the of, of the accidents where we can actually say something something a lot more about the chronic air coefficients than normally okay so any questions so far um so this was uh this was a sample problem. So now I'm going to tell you a little bit about the connections with complexity theory, which uh, I will talk a lot more about on Wednesday in person. Um, okay, so what's computational complexity about in a nutshell for the ones who, who are not used to this? Basically, we have, we can just think of a normal computer program that you write in any language it's all turing complete we're not even even later is turing complete but we're not going to get into those details um, so we have some kind of input it's a n bits string normal normally so n means and then is the size of the input and everything all the complexity is going to be measured in terms of this size uh, and uh, so, so we are computing something, uh, and usually we want to we want to have an answer to to a problem which is either a decision problem, which is basically a yes or no answer. So, given input size i, is there an object x such that whatever? So one can actually formulate this in terms of languages, but but I, I would formulate it in terms of a like a mathematics problem. And then there is there are the two major classes, the class P, when when we can find the answer in a polynomial time, polynomial in term in in the input size. So this is poly time. And then there is a cl the class N P. So this non-deterministic Turing machine, but in practice, how do we think of it? If uh, these are this is the class of problems for which, if there is uh, the answer is yes, then there is a witness which can be verified in n to the n to the d time. So uh, and the class n p of is studied and characterized by its complete problems which are just there is now a big universe of np complete problems so they are they can be reduced polynomial time from each other so determining whether a graph is pre-colorable uh, whether a, a boolean formula is uh, satisfiable so three of what Three, uh, this is for three sub. Whether a graph has a Hamiltonian cycle, of course, you just the witness of this problem, for example, is you just take uh, if the answer is yes, then you just give it a list of vertices which represent the Hamiltonian cycle and you go through them and so on. And then there are the counting problems when we actually want to compute an integer given the input. And then there is the class FP where the same thing so uh, can be found in polynomial time and the class Sharpie, where it's exactly this thing with the combinatorial interpretation. So Sharpie would be the number of objects in uh, in some and uh, some collection where these objects are computable in polynomial time exponentially many usually exponentially many objects each of them computable in polynomial time of course the big question is are these two classes equal well i'm not gonna 
I mean, probably they are not <laughs> they are not equal, but uh, nobody has any idea of how to do this. So, and in in, ter in this in this language, we can actually make all of this about the all these speculations about chronic ear coefficients a lot more precise. So, so here are some examples from from algebra and combinatorics. For example, dimension of irreducible modules. This is the hook, famous hook length formula. Well, it's a closed form formula. You can compute it in time n. This is, so here is an example. And this is in P, in the class P. And then there are Koska numbers. So um, they, they, there are dimensions of the, the the weight space corresponding to mu in the vial, in the vial module corresponding to lambda. So this is another object in representation theory, and it's already hard. So so actually deciding whether they are non-zero is um, is easy because all we need is to verify some linear inequalities between partitions. This is the dominance order. But uh, deciding whether finding their number, there is no more formula. And in fact, this is sharp P complete when the input is in binary. And we strongly believe that the, it's also true when the input is in unary. So this is basically reducing the, uh, in, when we say the input is in unary, we can think of as, allowing much bigger input in some sense and still have uh, exponential complexity. Sorry, uh, much smaller input and still have in, in exponential complexity. And then there are the little Wood Richardson coefficient. So it's a famous theorem by Alan Knudsen and Terry Tao from uh, 2001 that we can actually decide whether a little Wood Richardson coefficient is positive in polynomial time. This is because of uh, it corresponds to a polytope, the polytope defined by what the inequalities, which linear inequalities that describe these objects. And uh, this polytope has integer vertices. So if it's non-empty, then it has, um, then it has a, a positive the number of integer points is uh, gives the little wood richardson coefficient so all you need to do is check whether a polytope is non empty and this is linear programming and this is easy well relatively easy to do so it's done in polynomial time but uh, but little wood richardson coefficients are actually they generalize the Costco number so computing them is certainly going to be sharply hard in uh, in binary when the input is in binary but it's actually also what's called uh, strongly sharpy hard uh, i believe and uh, let's finally check the chronic ear coefficients well of course the characters of the symmetric group so first there is one problem so characters are can be also negative positive zero and so on so we can check we can ask a decision problem is the character zero or not the evaluation of the character and this is our input and uh, we can also ask to compute the absolute value of the character and in fact it's uh, strongly NP-hard, meaning that the input can be in unary and it's still NP-hard. And uh, to compute it is sharp P-hard. And in fact, uh, it's going to be the, it's the difference of two uh, independent sharp P functions. So we cannot really hope for a sharp P formula. And, uh, and the chronic ear coefficient, they are known to be NP hard in uh, even when the input is in unary. And uh, well, and it's but using the character formula or some other ones, one can show that they are in gap P, so they're difference of two sharp P functions, but they're always non-negative. So are they in sharp P? 
or not is actually the big problem of this combinatorial interpretation. Um, any questions so far? Okay, so I think I should probably stop. Um, so I'll just give you there. Well, here I'm not going to explain the algebraic, the geometric complexity theory where the Kronecker coefficients play a different role. This is going to be left for Wednesday's talk. Uh -huh. So there is a question. Yes, so, so, so the cron positivity being NP hard, so they are multiplicities, which means that they are zero, one, two, and so on. So the question is, can we decide if it's zero or not? So positive means strictly positive. So that's the question, yeah. And uh, yeah, so even just deciding whether they're zero or not is hard. The Littlewood-Richardson coefficients are not. <laughs> Um, and but this is with the little with Richards, and this is an accident basically, just uh, they're especially nice. Okay, and so I'm not gonna talk about the geometric complexity theory. You this is gonna be left for uh Wednesday in person. And thank you very much. <laughs> So any questions, <laughs> I guess? Uh, uh, Greta, um, I want to ask you, uh, you said that, that there is no closed formula for the number of partitions, uh, but I have heard that uh, Ken Ono, Ken Ono found it. Is it true or not? Uh, <laughs> I, <laughs> so I don't know what Ken Ono found. Um, and uh, I mean, there are, Certainly, there are formulas for the number of partitions, which which are big sums of things. Um, so, so I don't know exactly what 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 he found, but there is no uh, like we can't just say this is a product of some some simple numbers that that comes out. So this maybe maybe in the same sense that. Um, um, like we study with integrals, so some functions don't don't have nice integrals. This is this is something similar. So yeah, uh, but uh, I should say that the, for the number of partitions, so we cannot apply this far formalism with the complexity theory and say that this is not in P or this is sharp P complete because it is actually in P using the recursions. It's not so hard to compute the number of partitions. Okay. Yeah, so yeah, I, it's, uh, thank you. <laughs> yeah, so it's, yeah, it's, I don't know what, it's, it would be interesting to see what his formula does, but yeah. Uh, I have also uh, one question, may I ask? Sure. Yeah, uh, it is, you are working with representation uh, over the complex numbers. Mm -hmm. Right. So, what about finite characteristics? On one side, it's more complicated, but maybe you can do some filtrations. Right. So, yeah. So, going to to positive characteristic, actually, you can extract some more information about the Kronecker coefficients. This is what Christina Besson wrote actually does, um, but it's. Um, but it's a little bit ad hoc in the sense that that these things would apply only for special situations, some divisibility properties of, of the part of the parts, and so on and so forth. And uh, it's not uh, because from uh, from point of view of uh, physics, you can somehow think about uh, Hecke algebras and Hecke algebras in some root of unity and then compare to 
to models uh, of uh, finite characteristics symmetric group. And well, this is just vague idea. Yeah, I mean, there's maybe something from physics can, can help. Yeah, I, you are right. There is probably another approach. Um, so I, I would say that uh, looking from the side of Hecke algebras could be uh, could be helpful. So replacing, <laughs> you have a classical Schulbaum theory uh, duality between a linear group and a symmetric group, but you can uh, say something similar quantum Schulbaum duality between Hecke algebras and uh, deformations of. Uh, universe of enveloping algebras in, in the sense of, of, of dream fold. Mm -hmm. And then this could be a context to, to restate some, some part maybe, especially looking at, at, the, at the roots of unity. Yes, and I mean, one can, one can do a, what's the, what they call quantum generalization. So just add a Q to the parameter yeah, yeah. Q, Q to the, yes. Well, so uh, in the most of the cases, this is somehow repeating yeah. But uh, maybe at the root of unity, you, you can have some kind of filtration. So uh, actually cutting the problem in, into some well-defined pieces. Yeah, you're right. So this approach hasn't really been explored. Um, I, so I usually study this chronic air coefficients with the help of, of symmetric functions that I didn't mention. So there are sure functions behind all this. And of course, yeah, exactly. You can go one step further and you can do this. You can add the Q and T parameters. So go to McDonald polynomials and all this. And one of the problems was that somehow we lost, we lost the representation theory behind which was telling us all these nice things about positivity, not, I mean, non-negativity uh, and, uh, and so on. So, so maybe there, there, maybe there is something, something else which would allow us to, to do that. <laughs> Yeah, that's a good idea. Thanks. Okay, thank you. Very nice talk. Appreciate it. More questions, comments? Okay, if there are none, then uh, we can uh, go to the informal part of this meeting. Uh, which means that you can speak uh, your native language if you wish. Uh, and uh, uh, I, I will stop recording at this point. Uh, so you can uh, discuss whatever topics you like. Um, so please uh, 